Okay, we are live. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's hard to, for me to see how many members of the public are here, but I appreciate uh, everybody from the committee and um, our panelists for joining us this morning. Um, welcome officially to the, uh, this meeting of the Committee of the Revision of the Penal Code, which is now in session. I am Mike Romano, uh, Chair of the Committee. Uh, once again, I appreciate everyone joining today in this current circumstances and in this format. Uh, before we get to the substance of our work today, a few ground rules. Uh, we are going to hear today from three panel witnesses, which is scheduled for an hour and a half total. Um, each panelist will give an opening presentation of no more than 10 minutes, and then we'll go to Q&A from the committee. Members of the public will then have a chance for comment after the panel. We expect comments to begin around 11 a.m. Uh, when that time comes, if you have a comment, please select the raise hand function on your Zoom. If you're calling in, hit pound, uh, excuse me, star nine, but do not do this now. Uh, I will uh, instruct you to do so when we go to that period. All right, I want to begin with a quick roll call of the committee members. I'll go in alphabetical order. Senator Burton. Uh, Judge Espinoza. Assemblymember Kamlager. Hi. Uh, Justice Moreno. Here. Good morning. Uh, Dean Richardson. Good morning. And I know that uh, Senator Skinner is called to the floor of the Senate, so she won't be here, but apparently members of her staff are observing, so um, we welcome them as well. Um, finally, now to the substance of today's hearing. Today, we're going to hear about uh, the connection between incarceration and crime rates and how recent reforms in California can be measured on that score. As many of you know, California has been a leader in reforming its sentencing laws to reduce the number of people it incarcerates. One of those reforms, uh, criminal justice realignment in 2011 was described by Joan Peter Cilia, who let me just pause and say, was a very good friend of mine and recently passed away. Uh, she described it as the biggest penal experiment in modern, modern history. Um, as these reforms were enacted and implemented, California reduced its state prison population by over 20%. Many expressed concern that reducing incarceration would lead to a surge in crime. This included Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito, who predicted, quote, a grim roster of victims in his dissent from the United States Supreme Court's approval of a court order requiring California to reduce its prison population. I expect we'll hear today that Justice Alito was wrong in his dire prediction, and at least from a crime rate perspective, realignment has been a success. Statewide crime rates are lower today than they were before realignment. And between 2010 and 2019, crime rates in California's largest cities have fallen more than 10% and are at record lows. But despite what California has accomplished, we still have about 115,000 people incarcerated in our prisons, which remain under overcrowded and under federal court order. In addition, before the virus, there was an average of an additional 70,000 people in our jails every day. Again, most county jails are also under some kind of court order to curtail overcrowding, and thousands of people are released early from county jails every year to manage the overflow of prisoners. In addition, taken together, these cities and counties spend roughly $50 billion a year on local law enforcement, the criminal legal system, and incarceration in prison and jails in California. In other words, based on the sheer quantity of people we lock up and the money we spend to do it, there appears to be more California can do. And today we'll learn more about the efficacy of prison sentences in terms of their impact on public safety, which is our priority. And of course, let me conclude by saying that this does not even address the familiar, but still shocking racial disparities that the governor and legislature directly, addressed, directly told us to address and which recent protests, of course, have brought to the world's attention. I hope that the discussion today will move this conversation and these issues forward. So thank you very much. With that, I'm going to introduce our panelists. They are among the leading experts in their fields, and we are extremely lucky to benefit from their experience today. I want to now thank them for giving their time and their energy to the committee. The panelists are Professor Stephen Raphael from UC Berkeley Goldman School of Public Policy, Caitlin O'Neill, who is Senior Fiscal and Policy Analyst, analyst from the Legislative Analyst's Office, and Cheris Kubrin, uh, from UC Irvine Department of Criminology, Law, and Society. 
Uh, each of the panelists, uh, we, you will have 10 minutes from your presentation and we will reserve the bulk of our time for Q&A conversation with the committee. Please know that we have read your submissions and related materials. So let's try to move quickly to, over your initial thesis and get into the details as quickly as possible. I, assume, I understand that some of you have presentations that you'd like to uh, be able to give via Zoom. I hope that that all works out. Uh, Professor uh, Raphael, I, we'd love to begin with you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Uh, okay, well, uh, good morning, everybody, and, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to come talk to the, to the, um, to the panel. Uh, I'm going to spend some time today talking about what the academic research uh, about the relationship between incarceration and crime says. And at the very end, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about what's happened in California, though I'll, I'll leave the balance of, what I'm, uh, of that discussion to Professor Kubrin, who, who has done important research on that topic. So th there, there is a large academic literature that uh, looks at the extent to which incarceration is effective at controlling criminal offending. There are generally three causal pathways that people, uh, that researchers in the path have hypothesized link incarceration rates to crime. The first is that uh, incarceration incapacitates people. And if they're incapacitated, they're not uh, able to commit crime in non-institutional society, or they can still commit crimes within institutions, but, but not in, among non-institutional society. There's a body of research that tests whether the threat of a prison sentence uh, and variation in the, in the severity of a prison sentence deters people from committing crime. It's a, a pathway oftentimes referred to as general deterrence by criminologists. And then there's another body of research that tries to look at what the long-term effects of criminal justice involvement and in particular incarceration is on people's future offending trajectories. And there are, are those who, are, who hypothesize that people could be specifically deterred by their experience. In other words, that, that having uh, suffered a, a prison or jail sentence, they, they desist because they don't wanna go back or they may experience rehabilitative programming that might impact their, uh, their future, their future um, activity. And then there are other people who hypothesize in the other direction, right? That um, serving time can be, uh, to use a, a sort of buzzword, criminogenic or, or enhancing a future criminal activity. And that could happen via a number of, of um, vet, uh, ways, right? People are stigmatized when they come out, they have a hard time finding work. Uh, that might um, make uh, crime a, a, a sort of, you know, one of the last alternatives for generating income, or people might acculturate to different norms or be exposed to peers and so on and so forth that impact their, their future. And th so this is theoretically the way people frame uh, this deb debate among criminologists and social scientists that study crime. In terms of what we know, uh, in terms of criminal incapacitation, um, there's, it seems to be that there's general agreement that, that the, the propensity to offend varies greatly across the population and that, you know, there are very few of us that, that commit uh, serious offenses um, and that even among people with criminal histories, offending tends to decline with age. Um, it, the interesting thing is even if you look within institutional populations, for example, within the population of inmates in the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, there's great heterogeneity in, in behavioral uh, um, uh, infractions in prison, right? So we do see that even among people who have convicted, there's heterogeneity and the likelihood that people are gonna engage in, in offending. And that being said, the incapacitation effect is gonna be quite heterogeneous. Now, what we know from the research is that uh, in high incarceration settings in the US and California is historically and by na uh, international standards a high incarceration setting, the average incapacitation effect tends to be smaller. And that's simply because we're, we're uh, sort of casting a wider net when we use incarceration and we tend to incarcerate people into older ages when they're uh, less effective. While on the other hand, in much lower incarceration settings, for example, Europe, Italy, the Netherlands, uh, France, where there, there's uh, research on this question, average incapacitation effects tend to be higher, largely because they're, uh, they're not using the tool to the extent that, that, uh, that we do. And it's generally suggestive of what an economist would refer to as diminishing returns to scale. In terms of general deterrence, um, 
there, there's a, a very large literature on this. Uh, the, 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 um, the, just to summarize my reading of it is that evidence of um, making stiff punishments stiffer on, on deterring uh, people's offenses is not that strong. On the other hand, there's some evidence that uh, when, when sentence enhancements are targeted and they're well known to the people that might be engaging in the activity that's trying to be deterred, there's some evidence of impacts, but they tend to be small. There's a, a current active debate regarding whether sanctions, certainty, and swiftness uh, matters. So there, there are a couple of, of programs that have been implemented in Hawaii and have been tried, they've, people have tried to reproduce it in the, in the, in the mainland, um, where they have uh, sort of swift, certain, but modest sanctions. And there's, there's some uh, uh, evidence that that matters in some settings, but not in others. And we can get into that in the Q&A if, if we would like. Um, in terms of specific deterrence to criminogenic effects, there's evidence from some settings, and in particular Scandinavian countries, that, that incarceration spells can, in principle, be rehabilitative. Um, those are correctional settings that invest quite a bit in, in training, uh, in uh, therapeutic uh, interventions, and uh, the, the conditions of confinement are, are quite different than they are in the United States. Um, in the U.S., you have evidence going both ways, right? You have uh, some very high-quality research studies finding evidence that, that people who have been to prison uh, desist from offending at a slightly higher rate, but you also have evidence that uh, exploits basically random assignment of cases to judges and the interjudge differences in uh, the, the average disposition outcomes that tend to show that, um, you know, and in incarceration spell during one's uh, teenage years results in more offending as an adult and less employment. And then other, other uh, similar research looking at adult corrections finding that um, uh, incarceration spells on the margin tend to increase future offending, reduce employment prospects, and sometimes uh, increase reliance on public assistance. In general, I think that you know, a, a fair summary of this research is that there's, there's a lot of good research the results are heterogeneous, and it probably reflects the fact that, that um, the results are heterogeneous and dependent on, on specific context. Um, so we know in California, we've had uh, major reforms between realignment and Prop 47 that have led to big declines in the incarceration rate. So here's a, a simple graph showing the prison incarceration rate. The blue line is the, is the overall United States. The red line is California. Um, these vertical lines here are, you know, when realignment went into effect, when Prop 47 went into effect, and we can see an enormous decline in incarceration in, in California to the point where in 2016, our state incarceration rate is back to what it was in 1990. And while I won't say much about the research on crime, I'll just point out one thing, right? So this is a graph the top is showing a long-term trend from 1960 to the present in violent crimes, part UCR, part one offenses. The bottom graph is showing long-term trends in property crimes. And we've simil I've similarly marked realignment, Prop 47, and the last time our incarceration rate was as low as it is today. And what you can see on these graphs is that you know, we've experienced large declines in crime over the last 20 years or so we've reversed our incarceration rate back to what it was in 1990, but our crime rate has not increased back to what it was in 1990. So, and in fact, there's uh, quite a bit now of careful research on what's happening over this time period. And, you know, there, there are technical issues about, you know, how is crime measured in Los Angeles and, and changes therein, or what's happening in California relative to other states and whether it's statistically significant. And researchers do focus on, on trying to come up with a precise estimate of what the exact effect is. But I think the, the 32,000 foot view is we basically rolled back half of our increase in incarceration and we didn't see a, a, a return to you know, what crime was in the 1990s when it was relatively high. Okay, that's, that's it for me. Thank you. Mike, I think you're muted. Oh, gosh. As, as, mu as many months as we've been doing this, I still forget to unmute myself. Uh, Caitlin? 
Right. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen as well. Uh, my name is Caitlin O'Neill, and I'm with the California Legislative Analyst Office, which is a nonpartisan budget and policy advisor for the state legislature. And I've been asked to provide a brief overview of recent changes that have impacted sentencing in California, as well as show you how uh, those changes have impacted correctional populations and correctional spending. The first change I'm going to discuss was uh, legislation approved in 2009 that um, made various changes, including increasing uh, credits that prison inmates earn that reduce their sentences for participating in rehabilitation programs. Um, made certain lower level parolees ineligible for revocation to prison on a parole violation and reduced the dollar value threshold between misdemeanor and felony theft crimes. Also in that year, 2009, what, um, legislation known as SB 678 was enacted that created a fiscal incentive for counties to reduce the number of felony probationers that they send to state prison. The 2011 realignment limited who could be sent to state prison by requiring that certain lower level offenders serve their terms uh, either in county jail or a combination of jail and the supervision of a, a county probation officer known as uh, mandatory supervision. It also required that counties uh, supervise certain offenders released from prison on what's called post-release community supervision rather than state parole agents supervising them. Prop 36, which was approved in 2012, eliminated life sentences for certain offenders under the state's three strikes law. Prop 47, approved in 2014, reduced penalties for certain offenders convicted of non-serious nonviolent property and drug crimes. Um, and then in 2014, a federal court that was providing and continues to provide oversight of the state's response to prison overcrowding ordered the state to implement various policies to reduce the prison population, including a parole process for nonviolent second strikers. In 2016, Proposition 57 was approved, um, and that expanded CDCR's authority to reduce inmates' terms through credits and to consider certain inmates for release prior to completing their full sentence. In recent years, there's been legislation that has expanded court's authority to um, resentence inmates um, to lesser terms upon the recommendation of a correctional administrator or a district attorney. And then also in recent years, there's been various modifications to sentencing enhancements, which are um, additional time offenders receive based on the circumstances of their offense or their criminal history. And um, I won't go into them in detail in the interest of time, but they are listed on the handout here. Um, and then on page four, you'll see that there, you'll see a figure depicting the change in the state prison and parole populations over the past decade. Um, as you can see, the gray bars, which show the prison population, um, declined by about a quarter over this period. Um, and the parole population, the dark bar here, declined by about half, um, primarily as a result of these policy changes I discussed. The most significant reductions occurred between 2011 and 2014, um, resulting from the 2011 realignment. And then after 2014, you see what the populations have sort of steady out here a bit. Um, you can see declines, for example, here, uh, likely related to Prop 47 and the court ordered population reduction measures as well as Prop 57 here in the latter year. Um, but what, so, there, so these changes did contribute to population reductions, but what you're not seeing is that they were offsetting what was projected uh, growth in the inmate population. Um, and then at the tail end of the period, you'll see the, po the parole population increase and that's primarily caused by um, changes that ha such as Prop 57 that have accelerated inmates release from prison and cause a temporary bump in the parole population. And then on page five you'll see a similar figure but depicting county correctional populations. The first bar shows this population under supervision and the second bar shows the jail population. And in the pre-realignment period here um, we observed a, a 31,000 um, decline in the probation population, um, or about 9%, and a 12,000 decline in the jail population. This was primarily the result of uh, Chapter 28, which was the legislation that reduced the dollar threshold between misdemeanor and felony theft crimes. 
And then in between 2011 and 2014, we see an increase in both the supervision population with the um, introduction of the new um, realigned populations here under community supervision, uh, county community supervision. And we also see an increase um, in the jail population, both of these trends re primarily resulting from the 2011 realignment. And then after 2014, we see a decline, a steady decline here in the um, population under county community supervision. That population declined by about 60,000 individuals or 18% over this period. And the jail population declined by about 9,000 individuals. And this was um, likely due to the effects of Prop 47. On page six, you'll see two pie charts. These show the total state and local correctional population in 2009 and then in 2018. And what I'll point out here is that there was a, a 170,000 person decline um, in the total population between those two years or about a quarter. And the dark, um, shade, the dark shaded portions here represent the county share of the correctional population which grew uh, from 60% of the, the total to 66% of the total state and local correctional population in 2018. And while that really isn't surprising that we would see an, an increase in the county share given that realignment and other policies I discussed um, resulted in individuals who would otherwise be in state jurisdiction being under county jurisdiction. What's perhaps more interesting is that it didn't, the share of under county jurisdiction didn't increase by more um, during this period. And that was because the 2011 realignment and other, the other changes, while they did result in a large decrease in the state populations, they, we didn't see a, um, co the corresponding increase in the county populations was smaller. And that was for various reasons. Um, for example, Proposition 47 reduced the time that some realigned offenders serve at the county level. On page six, you'll see a figure showing state or CDCR, specifically uh, correctional expenditures between 2009 and 2017 in the gray bars and then county jail and probation expenditures um, in the darker gray bars. And first, uh, taking a look at the state expenditures, those grew over this period by 2.6 billion or 28%. And that despite the declines in the population, um, that was primarily driven by three factors. First was that the state had to comply with costly court orders to reduce prison overcrowding and make improvements to inmate health care. Uh, the second was that the state experienced a significant increase in employee compensation costs that was driven primarily by uh, increased pension costs, not unique to CDCR, but across the state. Um, and also raises that were given to employees during this period. And the third reason um, was that the state was experiencing a fiscal crisis in the early part of this period. And in response to that crisis, crisis it deferred various costs to the later portion of this period that is shown in the figure. And so, for example, the furloughing of correctional officers um, during the fiscal crisis was an example of one of these cost shifts. So that contributes to the increasing trend in uh, CDCR expenditures. Um, and then the county expenditures, um, those dark, darker bars, grew by about 1.6 billion over the period or 38%. Um, and that could be for various reasons. We haven't had an opportunity to do a deep dive into um, the reasons that each of the county's um, expenditures grew, but it could be forced that they grew for similar factors um, that caused the state expenditures to grow. Um, and then we also note that some of the expenditures here that you're seeing on um, that are county expenditures um, in these darker bars are, um, are funding that the state provides to the counties, um, such as funding provided for the, 20, the realigned offenders. And then finally, I'll just show you this figure that shows how the state prison and parole populations um, are projected to decrease and um, increase respectively um, by 2024. And specifically, uh, CDCR has projected a 9,000 or 7% decrease in the prison population and a 2,000 or 4% um, increase in the parole population, primarily resulting from Prop 47. 
Uh, and while all projections are, of course, subject to uncertainty, I would note these are subject to significant uncertainty because they don't include the effects of um, COVID-19, which appears to be uh, reducing crime and arrests, but also, um, also has caused the state to take actions that have um, affected the size of the prison population. Um, and then they also don't include proposals that are currently being considered as part of the state budget process. Um, and if enacted, those would substantially reduce these populations. And then finally, I would note that to the extent these, these, the inmate population decline does bear out um, and the state closes prisons as the governor has indicated he intends to do for two prisons by 2022-23, that would um, create significant uh, savings in the range of hundreds of millions of dollars for the state. And that concludes my comments and I will take questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very, very helpful. Uh, Charisse? Can everyone see that? Great. Okay. Well, uh, Again, my name is Sharis Kuber, and I'm a professor here at UC Irvine in the Department of Criminology, Law and Society. Thank you for the invitation to present my research on the impact of prison downsizing on crime in California. And this is a research agenda that I began when I moved from Washington, D.C. to California in 2011, just as realignment was getting underway. Now, I knew nothing about realignment, but the moral panic around it was real. I very quickly tuned into that. As you all recall, there were dire predictions that realignment was going to cause this crime wave like California had never seen. Recidivism rates would skyrocket. There were also concerns that AB 109 would lead to massive jail expansion and 58 mini platas. And, you know, despite all of these concerns, as you all know, there was no state funding set aside to evaluate its impact, no organization responsible for assessing realignment's costs and benefits. And as was mentioned by Mike at the, at the introduction, Joan Peter Celia said this was the case despite realignment being the biggest criminal justice experiment ever conducted in America. And I remember arriving to California thinking, well, how could this be? And I decided I want to get involved um, and, and maybe try and help um, address the research lacuna in this area. And so along with um, my colleague, Dr. Carol Saron here at UCI, we got funding from the National Science Foundation and the UC Office of the President to hold what was a two-day workshop at UCI where we brought together the leading scholars researching prison downsizing and its impact, not just in California, but around the United States. And we organized the workshop around four key themes where researchers presented on each of these themes. And the first theme, because we really wanted to understand the historical context and the arc of realignment and its impact was um, around the origins of the crisis. And so we addressed questions such as what were the historical roots of the crisis that led California to find itself between, before the Supreme Court in Brown v. Plata. Our second theme was the diffusion and translation of law and policy reform, asking questions such as how has the ruling and subsequent realignment legislation been translated across the state? What did it look like at the county level? My personal interest, which was theme three, the effects of realignment on the criminal justice system, particularly did realignment cause crime and recidivism rates to rise as critics had predicted. And then finally, we wanted to talk about the future of decarceration and more broadly, the role of the judiciary and prison litigation in prison reform nationally. And we wanted to know whether California's experiment could be exported to other states that were facing similar pressures. Now, we had all of the presenters come, they did original research, and we were able to publish all of their papers collectively in a special issue of the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science uh, with the title, The Great Experiment, Realigning Criminal Justice in California and Beyond. And at the time, this was the first systematic scientific analysis of realignment and its impact. Now, there's lots of findings in the volume. So for those of you that are interested, I, I would suggest checking out the volume. I just want to talk briefly today about the findings related to crime, because I think that's of greatest interest to the panel here. Um, so I'll be talking about another panelist's work in this. Um, Magnus Lofstrom and Steve Raphael did our study on um, the impact of realignment on statewide crime rates. They did a pre-post analysis um, over this time frame. I'm gonna jump right to the findings here. This is sort of a key figure from their, their paper. 
what you see here is the dark line, the black line is violent crime and the gray is property crime. The vertical line shows you the last pre-realignment month as you see. What you can see is for, for violent crime, almost no, there was no impact of realignment on violent crime. In many ways, that's not surprising. Realignment wasn't targeted toward that class of offenders. However, when you look at property crime, you do see a slight uptick following realignment's impact. What they found was that realignment had, a, had an impact on, on property crime, but only for the crime of auto theft. They did a great um, cost benefit analysis where they found that one year served in prison prevented about 1.2 auto thefts. Um, and saved the state about $12,000 in crime related costs, of course, as well as costs to the victims and their family. On the other hand, the cost of putting that person in one year, had we not had realignment, uh, would have cost the state, and this is in 2013 dollars, close to $52,000. So what they conclude at the end of the day is that at the statewide level, the prison crime effects were small and the criminogenic consequences of realignment have been modest. Now, um, my colleague and I decided to um, get out these findings as far and wide as we could in light of the politicization of this uh, reform. And we did everything from publish an op-ed in the Washington Post to go up to Sacramento where we spoke with representatives and gave talks, spoke with anybody in the media that was interested. Pacific Standard did a really nice overview of the volume. And during our outreach, something really interesting happened. And that was that nobody cared about realignment um, and what impact it had on crime because people were consumed at the moment with Prop 47, the latest reform that had been passed. People wanted to know what did Prop 47 do to crime? Well, maybe realignment didn't cause it to go up, but certainly Prop 47 did. And we know um, that once Prop 47 um, went into effect, um, it too saw the same kinds of headlines where we saw reporters talking about crime waves and explosions of property crime and spikes in crime. And uh, again, we saw the same situation where no funding was set aside to evaluate it. And also um, there, there hadn't been any, of any evaluation up until that point. I decided this time I was gonna do the study myself and I found a grad student here at UC Irvine that was interested in doing it with me, Bradley Barto. So we got set on doing our own study where we were examining the effect of Prop 47 on crime in the year following its implementation. So this is 2015. We wanted to look at its effect on violent and property crime, those um, offenses listed there. And to do that, we created a state level panel data set um, on UCR part one offenses going all the way back to 1970 through 2015. So quite a long time series here. And in an ideal world, we would love to do an experiment where we would randomly assign some states in the United States to get Prop 47 and other states to not get Prop 47. And then we could look at crime in California, sorry, the, the states that got the, the um, experimental condition and those that were in the control group. Obviously, as we know, that's not possible. So uh, what we did was the next best thing, which is a natural experiment or a quasi-experimental design has all the benefits of an experimental approach minus the random assignment. Now there's lots of different types of quasi-experimental designs, but the one that we chose, which is a common um, approach used in the social sciences, economics, um, public health, and other um, fields is called the synthetic control group design. And what this approach does is allows us to create a comparison unit that approximates or looks like California had it not enacted Prop 47. And what we do is we can compare crime in California and this comparison unit, which we call counterfactual or synthetic California. And we can look at what happened in crime in California and counterfactual California in 2015 and any distance or change in distance between the two time series that emerges following this intervention can be considered Prop 47's causal impact. And in this way, we're isolating the impact of the policy, kind of controlling for all of the other factors that lead to crime. I'm happy to talk more about that a little bit later. Now, the confidence in our findings is predicated on the quality of our comparison unit, like what is synthetic California? So how did we do that? Well, synthetic California represents a weighted combination of states that optimally fit California's crime trends in the pre-intervention time period. That's 1970 to 2014. So what we're looking for is an amalgamation of states that mimicked California's crime, 
crime trends prior to Prop uh, 47 going into um, being implemented. Now, are the states that were eligible for this are all states that did not experience a Prop 47 style intervention. And because no other state did, all of those states, all of the remaining states were eligible. And what we did is we created a synthetic California for all of the crime types that we examined. So robbery, burglary, theft, and so on and so forth. Okay, what did we find? So these are figures showing findings for homicide, rape, aggravated assault, and robbery. The dark line, the solid line is treated. That is what actually happened in California. The dashed line is synthetic California. So those states that mimicked California for each of those crimes. The vertical line towards the end there is when Prop 47 was implemented. And so what I want you to see first here is that we did a pretty good job. If you look in the pre-intervention time period before Prop 47 was implemented, you see that the lines for most of the crimes excluding rape are pretty much on top of each other, suggesting we found a pretty good comparison unit to California. But what I want you to focus on is what happened after the dashed vertical line there, the crime trends um, following Prop 47's implementation. For homicide, aggravated assault, and robbery, you can see they're pretty much on top of each other. What this means is that Prop 47 really had no impact on these offenses whatsoever. In other words, the impact of Prop 47 on homicide, aggravated assault, and robbery was null. I'm going to uh, not talk about rape here because of some problems with the quality of the data, but I'm happy to answer questions about that later. If we look at burglary, burglary, the top panel, we can see again, those two lines are flush right on top of each other. No impact of, of Prop 47 on burglary, according to our findings. However, for larceny thefts and motor vehicle thefts, we do see a slight uptick in treated, that is California, that suggests that Prop 47 may have had a slight impact on these two crimes. Now, before we can confirm whether this was in fact the case, we ran a series of what are called post-estimation tests or robustness checks. Happy to talk more about what those look like later, but what they allow us to do is determine whether the findings for larceny and motor vehicle theft are true or whether they may be altered by things like spuriousness or small findings that don't rule out, that can't rule out noise in our models. Again, happy to answer questions about that. To make a long story short, what we found is that when we did these post-estimation tests, the findings for larceny and motor vehicle theft were not, they, they did not, they were not um, sufficiently secure, if you will, for us to have confidence that we could rule out a null finding. In other words, they could be um, sensitive to spuriousness and they could be small enough that noise could have accounted for those findings. So what we conclude overall is no evidence of a statistically significant robust increase for any of these crimes in the year following Prop 47's enactment, suggesting that we can downsize our prisons without risking public safety. That's sort of the punchline of both the realignment and Prop 47 studies. Um, we published those findings in um, the journal Criminology and Public Policy, Double Blind Peer Review Process, Top Policy Journal in the Field. And we also set out to bring attention to this um, beyond academia. We published an op-ed in Governing Magazine, spoke to reporters, New York Times did a wonderful piece, not just on this research, but research more broadly in California. The Public Policy Institute of California issued their findings on Prop 47, which were not that different from what we found. So it was a nice review piece of all of those findings. Um, criminal justice, um, uh, I guess the politicization of these reform continues, as you all know, uh, there's rollbacks being proposed. So um, research should continue to be at the forefront of these debates here. Um, I hope to continue contributing to this debate uh, via research, but uh, happy to take question and answer uh, when it's appropriate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kubrin. Um, we are going to, thanks, great. All right, we're going to move to the question and answer uh, period now. I have a, a, a bunch of questions, and I'm going to use my uh, prerogative of chair to, to kick things off. But I really do hope that this becomes a conversation as best as possible with the whole committee. Um, I want to begin with um, Steve and Professor Raphael. And, and perhaps this also applies to you, Professor Kubrin. Your last slide, Professor Raphael, showed uh, California's crime rate over the past 30 or 40 years. 
I think it's impossible to deny that we've experienced a really historic drop in crime, right? At the same time as we've experienced an increase in the prison population. Um, I know a lot of things go into uh, crime rates. It's not only incarceration, but how do the correlation just pops off the page. And I know that seems counter to your research, but I was wondering if you had either theories or ideas about why crime uh, rates dropped so severely, if not uh, as a result of the increased incarceration. Uh, well, I, I, you know, I, I think it would be inaccurate to say that there's no evidence of, of changes in incarceration on crime. I think maybe a more accurate way to describe it is that there's evidence that, that when you put more people away, it, it does incapacitate, but the, the marginal effectiveness of that declines with scale. And you even see that in, in very low incarceration settings. For example, there's, there's research in the Netherlands where you know, they, uh, a, a, a economist named Ben Villard evaluated a policy that extended two year sentences to people that had 10 or more prior felony thefts. And they actually rationed the localities how many they could use and they dipped into the local pool of people who had the criminal histories that would satisfy. And what they found is even in a, in a country where their, their prison and pretrial population was 100 per 100,000, the places that were allowed to use it more extensively were incapacitating fewer crimes. So I, I think, you know, it's, it's, you know, if we were to, you know, let, if we were to completely eliminate prison, we'd probably have more crime, but that doesn't necessarily mean reducing from where we are is going to lead to big increased crime. That's one. But in terms of the, the long-term trends, you know, they, I think the jury is kind of out. It seems to be to be now that many people are starting to believe that there may be some sort of difference between the cohorts today and the cohorts in the past and their propensity to engage in criminal activity that may have, you know, everything to do with um, uh, difference in blood lead levels between people that are younger than us and people that are our age because of the Clean Air Act and differences in digital media and so on and so forth. But there just seems to be a secular decline in, in offending for younger people that um, is, is difficult to explain. And then, of course, uh, you know, there's a, a, a big body of research trying to estimate the relationship between police staffing levels and crime that tends to suggest that that's a tool that, that, um, that on the margin can impact crime rates as well. Okay, so just to summarize, um, you don't think that uh, the, so the incarceration rate you think had some impact in the reduction in crime over the past, let's say 30 years in California, but is not um, the, driving contrib the driving force in, in the great drop in crime? I, no, I don't think so. And, and I think in some ways our, you know, our experiment rolled back incarceration rate to what it was 30 years ago and our crime rate is still at historical lows. So, um, you know, we've, we've revealed at least through our, through our actions that at least from, from today's standpoint, we could greatly reduce the use of one particular tool. And I, I loved uh, Caitlin's presentation of how the overall criminal justice footprint has, uh, has shrank. This is really arresting to see it happening not only in the correctional populations, but in the community corrections populations. And the fact that we haven't seen a, a huge increase in crime is very telling. Professor Kubrin, I was wondering if you could weigh in. Do you concur basically with those? Sure, ideas? yeah. So just to, to I, I completely agree with Dr. Raphael, which is that, you know, there's a lot of findings in the incarceration crime literature. One of the ones that stands out the most is diminishing returns. At some point, at, at higher and higher and ever higher levels of incarceration, you don't get the returns that you would want necessarily in terms of reductions in crime. So that's important. Um, you know, here, when you say higher and higher levels of incarceration, do you mean longer prison sentences or do you mean more people behind bars? I think it's more the net widening. Well, I, but I think it's a combination of both, right? You don't get diminishing returns, um, particularly among some populations as they age, right? There's an aging out of crime that is not, um, yeah, you're not capitalizing on that with longer sentences, but also casting the, the net wider shows that, that, you know, not all, not all particular types of offenders recidivate at the same rate. So um, the wider the net often, the less um, bang, if you will, uh, the less returns on reductions in crime you'll get. 
Um, so I just want to point out one thing here, which is that as you as as was already stated, crime is caused by so many different factors, and this makes a challenge to determine what causes crime to go up, down, or stay the same. I mean, everything from socioeconomic conditions, police community relations, drug markets, guns, criminal justice policies. Um, and so a real big challenge for criminologists is to isolate out in this case, the impact of the policy. Now, luckily the, the, the approaches that we've taken in our research allow us to do that. So isolating the impact of realignment or Prop 47 using this methodology is possible. In other words, what our studies are doing are, is in some ways controlling for these other causes of crime in order to determine what the unique impact of a policy was. And I say that is really important because what I typically see people doing is talking about crime going up or down or staying the same following a policy being implemented as evidence that the policy caused that trend. That, that, but other things may have been going up, down, or staying the same. Um, and so without really isolating the, the causal impact of a policy itself, it's very difficult to tease that out. And so this is why I think it's very important to have research of this kind. And there's been many other studies, not just the ones that I presented today, that have, have done that using these various methodologies. It'd be great to get those. Um, thank sure. you. Do other committee members have questions? I have a whole list, so. Dean Richardson, go ahead. I'm unmuting myself now. Okay, you can hear me. <laughs> I, I, just, I just have a, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, uh, no, no, Dean. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, I, I just have one, one question. Uh, first of all, I appreciate uh, the, uh, the presentations and, and largely uh, yeah. agree in particular with, I've always felt as a, as a trial judge in, in Los Angeles, uh, LA County for 11 years, that there's a definite correlation between age and incarceration. And I think, you know, by age, late 30s or 40, the uh, incentives and propensity to commit crimes definitely uh, lessens. But uh, I'm wondering if any of the, this is for uh, any of the presenters, do any of the studies uh, carve out the, the uh, uh, high level of recidivism among certain uh, uh, incarcerated uh, uh, individuals who have committed uh, multiple criminal offenses are, are they because it would seem to me that they would really increase the uh, significance or the amount of the prison uh, population a specific group of individuals uh, and in fact I think if those were, were carved out of the studies the results would be even better in terms of of lower incarceration but I'm just wondering if, in, in, if, if your studies reveal any kind of uh, carving out of the high recidivist violent uh, offenders and what impact that might have on some of the studies and uh, rates of incarceration and uh, the crime rate uh, that is happening in our society. Uh, I, I particularly focus on the larger urban areas like Los Angeles and, and San Francisco. Well, well, there, there was... Um... There was a very interesting pattern that happened with realignment um, that that we saw among people that were being released from prison. And so, so you know, prior to realignment, something like seventy percent of of inmates that were elite, released to parole would be returned within three years, right? Mm -hmm. And and a pretty high rate within one year. I think within one the one year return rate was on the order of forty or forty five percent. And once re realignment went into effect, you basically saw that decline discreetly, right? From 40% to 10% or, or around 10%. And that was largely because many of the people who were paroled instead of going to state parole were going to post-release community supervision and they could only be sent back to prison if they were convicted of a new crime. And so what, what we saw was a big reduction in returns to custody for a parole violation mm -hmm. and only the smallest increase in new cases that were brought by local DAs against, uh, against, um, uh, you know, against people who were, who were released and then returns to custody with a new term. And so uh, I know that prior to realignment, there was, you know, everybody used to say, 
And, you know, DAs would say this and, and even people in CDCR that a lot of the returns were for things that were crimes and it was just easy to, you know, turn right. to the parole and, and sort of, you know, fast track them back in for four or five months or six months or whatever it is. But it turned out that, that you know, we didn't see a materially huge increase in new prosecutions. And so, um, you know, in some ways recidivism is a strange concept because we measure it oftentimes by, a, by someone touching the system that they, you know, they violate and they're arrested or, you know, the parole officer finds something in their house and they're arrested. And it's, you know, it's correlated with behavior, obviously, but in many ways it's also determined by our rules. And so we changed one rule and our official recidivism rate dropped considerably. Um, you know, so people who were, you know, in, in the pre-realignment age doing life on the installment plan, as, as we, right. that, that stopped. And where it was was less likely the case for many, and and you know in the aggregate we just didn't see a, an increase in reported crimes that would suggest that that uh, um, that this change resulted in anything. And of course, there are people that recidivate and people that that do commit crimes when when they're released, um, but it it didn't move the aggregate crime rate uh, um, in any any meaningful way. Michael, can I chime in on something with that? Of course. I'm just going to share my screen very quickly here because, um, um, I, because of time, I didn't have a chance to talk about this today. But in the volume of the annals that I mentioned, we, there is a study on, on realignment's impact on recidivism. And that was done by Mia Bird and Reichen Grate. And they did a county level examination, really interesting findings. First, what they determined was that approaches to realignment took one of two things generally. There were counties that were enforcement focused where they allocated their realignment dollars to things like sheriff, jail beds, law enforcement. But they also found that some counties were more reentry focused where they allocated their realignment dollars to programs and services. They also noticed, this is a, a figure that shows changes in felony rearrest rates um, one year post realignment. So these are the various counties of California and what their recidivism rates looked like in the year following realignment. You could see Ventura, for example, huge increase in realignment, but Mendocino, San Luis Obispo declines. What they wanted to determine was whether there was a relationship between the approach that the county took and its outcome in terms of recidivism. And their big finding was that counties that invested in offender reentry and re rehabilitation actually had lower um, recidivism rates. They had a better performance in terms of recidivism. Not a huge finding, but still the felony rearrest rate, so these are felonies, was about 4% greater or higher for offenders that were released to enforcement focused counties than reentry focused counties. So their conclusion, let me just get out of share here, their conclusion was that um, you know, one way to tamp down on recidivism was to use your, your funding, your resources, as Caitlin described, all, all these resources being given in a way that was thinking outside the box rather than just putting people back in jail at the county level, thinking about post-release um, programs and services to help people reintegrate. Thank you. Um, Dean Richardson? So thank you to all the panelists. This was a fascinating uh, discussion. And I really appreciate it. Um, and it seems from hearing from all of you and reading all of your materials that your conclusions point in the same direction. And so since I have all of you here and because what we need to be thinking about is what are some of the recommendations we want to make um, to our penal code, in light, uh, and I'd love to hear from all of you. So in light of your expertise and your, your research, what, what recommendations do you have for us? What can we do as we think about the penal code to take advantage of the research that you've done and the fairly consistent findings across all of your research? I'd love to hear what your thoughts are since you're here. Why don't we start with Professor Kubrin? Oh. So this is a tough one um, <laughs> uh, because I'm really, I just want to focus and do the research. So I want, I want you know, changes to happen. And then I, um, you know, the thing that I've been focused on is, is really trying to stop the rollback of these reforms because it, now I feel like my sense is that there's a lot of challenges to the reforms. It's on the November ballot. People are trying to roll these things back and there's really no reason to roll them back. 
Um, you know, we the the state's been critiqued for not going far enough in its reforms. A lot of people are saying, well, it's easy to focus on the lowest level, the triple non, so to speak, non-serious, non-violent. You know, so um, I I don't have. I'm actually curious to hear what Caitlin has to say since she's so familiar with all the variety of reforms that are happening. But you know, at as a starting point, I would certainly take a very strong stand that these reforms should not be rolled back. They are quite effective. Um, they have not harmed public safety. You know, at least on that measure, um, rollback is not something I would encourage at all. But I, I I'm going to leave it up to my colleagues to, to to hear what they have to say about additional reforms moving forward. All right. Well, Caitlin and uh, Drew, if you'd like to weigh in. Uh... Curious to what you guys have thought on this. Sure. So we don't have recommendations on this question. Um, we have looked at the question of what options are available to the legislature regarding um, ways to reduce the prison population should it um, see that as a priority. Um, and sort of I could give a quick uh, overview of those options. Um, they kind of generally fall into two categories, which are to one, reduce prison admissions. Um, or to reduce prison time served. And to reduce prison admissions, um, changes could be made that would shift additional offenders to the counties. In other words, realign additional offenses because um, there are, there were, well, first of all, offenders who commit serious violent or sex offenses are, or have, are required to go to state prison, but there's also specific non, non, non crimes that still are requ required to be served in state prison. So um, there's options there that could be considered. Um, however, under the state constitution, uh, counties are not required to accept new workload related to the 2011 realignment unless this workload is funded by the state. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, and then another option would be to reduce restrictions on felony probation um, eligibility because offenders who can be granted probation in lieu of a state prison term. And there are certain restrictions um, in state law on when, um, when, a, when a judge is prohibited from granting probation or when probation is generally um, not um, advised, but is sort of in exceptional circumstances is allowed to be granted. So those, could, those rules could be revisited. Um, and then uh, also in this category of reducing pr prison admissions would be to convert wob crimes that are um, can be charged as either felonies or misdemeanors, often called wobblers, to misdemeanors, because misdemeanors um, must be uh, served at the local level. Um, and I would also note, just sort of as a global note, that um, some of these laws are enacted via initiative, um, voter initiative, which means that um, they may or not, may not be, the legislature may or may not be able to change them with either a 50% vote or two thirds vote, et cetera. Um, and then the second category would be, as I mentioned, to make changes that would reduce time served. Um, and so, as I mentioned, the state has recently enacted various changes that have reduced enhancements. So um, one option would be to do more of that. Um, an option that is available to CDCR under Prop 57 would be to increase credit earning for inmates in prison. Um, and Finally, the state could expand opportunities for release consideration um, for inmates who are in state prison. Um, for example, right now in the budget deliberations, there's a piece of trailer bill legislation being considered that would expand the existing elderly parole process to individuals who have, um, who are 50 years or older as opposed to 65 years or older and who have served less time in prison as opposed to the current requirement. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, Drew or Steven, do you have anything to add? I, I have some, some thoughts. I don't know if I have specific recommendations, but um, it, you know, I, I think if, if the goal is to reduce the size of the prison population, you know, either you're gonna reduce admissions or you're gonna reduce how much time people are there or both. And you know, we, we know that there's a strong age profile. And, and so if crime control is the chief objective, adding, you know, years to what would be a lengthy sentence would tend to 
um, you know, add to the prison population in, in steady state, but perhaps not add much to crime control. And, and I think just thinking about sort of the physics of the size of a dynamic population, you know, one person that is sentenced to 10 years in steady state adds as many people to the prison population as 10 people sentenced for one year. And so the, those long sentences are oftentimes what really add to population and then cost and, you know, especially because people are aging. And they oftentimes, you know, expand along a margin of incarceration where people are, are not that criminally active. So I, I think that that's one area to just kind of keep in mind. But I, I, I think as well, there is a research base that suggests that um, correctional authorities oftentimes have more information than than we would have about people, um, given you know how they're they're doing uh, their time, right? If they're complying, if they're you know they don't have a lot of institutional misconduct, if they're you know working and they're productive members, and you know there, there's a lot of activity that goes on in in corrections facilities where people have jobs and are going about their lives with little conflict, and to some degree you know, and the way Prop 57 is incentivizing people to earn good time credits, that, you know, maybe adding structure on the, the back end of the sentence that allows uh, uh, CDCR to, to sort of use the information they have to think about people that might be eligible for early release or time off their sentence and to incentivize people to engage in, in rehabilitative behavior that would, uh, or activities, that would perhaps result in their early release, I think would be a step forward and, and maybe shave some of the, of, you know, of the numbers off the population. Um, you know, aside from that, I also think just re-entry planning is really important, making sure everybody has their IDs, you know, and everything they need and, and trying to smooth the transition. Uh, you know, we, we know from, from research that the, you know, the, the first bit of time out of prison is, is a time period that's particularly uh, um, uh, sort of hard for people and, you know, they face a lot of risks of, you know, of being rearrested, of dying, right, of, of finding uh, themselves suffering homeless spells. And so that there are, you know, that's not a sentencing issue, but I, I think it's certainly wrapped up with uh, uh, trying to, you know, trying to ensure the best outcomes for people. Thanks. You stole one of the things that I wanted to circle back to. In the meantime, I see that uh, Assemblymember Kamlager has her hand up and Senator Burton, and then uh, Drew will come back to you too. But Assemblymember Kamlager. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the panelists for um, sharing this great information. I always look forward to these hearings. I have um, two questions. My first question is, you know, is there any correlation between the increase in jurisdictional um, DA and or police budgets and decrease in categorical crimes like recidivism? Is there yeah, I think that that's an excellent question. I was going to ask that too. A lot of the work that you uh, cited was sort of statewide. Um, I guess, uh, Professor Kubrin, you did allude to some sort of county differences. But right. I think that that really, well, anyway, not to jump Yeah, up. most of the work on realignment and Prop 47 is statewide because of the challenges of access to data. I'm not aware of any research that addresses that specific topic, um, but I might be missing something. I don't know if Caitlin or Steve have, uh, have come across a study, but I'm not, I'm not aware of, of, of research on that. How about nationally? Is this specifically police budgets? So police staffing? Well, police and, you know, DA, district attorneys, they have big budgets. Yeah. They well, well the, the, there is a, there is a, a quasi experimental literature on police staffing levels and crime yeah. um, that, that, you know, tries to find surges in policing associated with, you know, a terrorist attack or, you know, situations where foot patrols are enhanced. Um, th there's a, a recent paper by uh, Justin McCrary and Aaron Chalfin. They, they were both former Berkeley people, but now one's at Penn and one's at Columbia that um, analyzes data very similar to Professor Kubrin's analysis of Prop 47 using panel data for, for cities. 
And you know, they, they're ten, you, you tend to see that when you know when policing staffing levels increase, that there it does reduce crime, right? So that there there's evidence that um that there's a relationship between the input and uh, and that particular outcome. Can I say uh, one thing about that though, Steve? So that literature, not that particular study. Um, but that literature has is is has a challenge, which is an endogeneity issue. In other words, separating out the causal ordering, which comes first, the yeah. reductions in police impacting crime or crime leading to the police. So it's a very challenging. I mean, this the methodology that you're describing allows them to begin at that. But most of the work in that in this area, looking at police force size, police per capita, however you want to me measure it, and crime, kind of has challenges around measurement. My sense of the literature as a whole is that its police force size isn't as important relative to what the police are doing. So the substantive actions of the police seem to matter more than simply adding officers to the force. But I, ha I, I haven't read closely the study that Professor Raphael is talking about. Um, so that's my sense of the, the, the work before that. My understanding is that uh, John Pfaff's book, recent book, describes increase in prosecution of uh, personnel as leading to increased um, incarceration. But we can get to the bottom of that um, too. Uh, anyway, uh, Professor, I mean, Assembly Member Kamlanger, you had a second question? Yeah, so my second question is um, how are bench officers influenced by? Um, Cult, courtroom culture, um, and if this, how this impacts uh, the severity of sentences. What's a bench officer? I'm not. I'm not sure what a what a bench officer. Judges. Oh, judges. Um, so well, one example, I guess I could give that I've heard a lot about is this notion of the 170.6 sort of papering um, judges. But I believe, and this is my own bias, that there is some relationship between judges and uh, DAs, prosecutors. I mean, the courtroom space is sort of owned by these um, two entities. And so I just want to know if there's any relationship between those? And if so, how can one be influenced by the culture of a courtroom of a county? Well, well so not, I've never been a public defender or an attorney or a prosecutor or a judge. So, uh, you know, my experience is, is limited to um, the interactions I've had in, in, in very specific uh, jurisdictions. But I, I do know that that there does appear to be cross-judge heterogeneity in key outcomes that um, can be quite pronounced to the point where they actually serve as a research strategy for a lot of people. So, so just to give you an example, um, it's not uncommon for magistrates that are, are presiding over you know, arraignment hearings and making decisions regarding bail to have such large differences in outcome that it's almost like a random assigned, uh, randomly controlled trial, which judge you're assigned to. Or, you know, there, there's other research that shows that, you know, the outcomes of juvenile cases, the outcomes of adult felony cases can really hinge on what judge the case is, is uh, assigned to. And, and we, have, we have, you know, judges on the panel, maybe they can speak to this. But you, you do see evidence that there, you know, there are some judges that that for whatever reason, despite the fact that cases are randomly assigned in the jurisdiction, um, you know, the the dispositions are are more likely to be a, a prison sentence or less likely to be a prison sentence or more likely to be diverted or less likely to be diverted. And while of course the outcome is going to reflect the interplay between the prosecutor, the the defender, and 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 the judge. Um, you know, it's, it's clear that, that the judge at least is, is predictive of variance in the outcome, right? And, and I think m at least most researchers that are external to the system interpret that as the judge is influencing the outcome. I wanted to add that, again, it seems like most of the data is, is statewide or most of the studies are statewide, and yet there's such disparity in the way that prop, um, 
realignment has been implemented, but policing, prosecution levels in different counties. I believe crime went up in some counties post realignment and post Prop 47 and went down in other counties. Yeah. Um, and um, that's one of the things that I think um, is going to be our charge to try to get as much data as we can to really suss out the differences between the counties because we have, a, again, a sort of natural experiment where there's been a statewide change in law, but really different uh, uh, implementation. And, um, you know, this has come I, up. I more. completely agree. I think the next phase of research in this area, you know, we have a saying crime is local. And whether it's, you know, the courtroom working group, whether it's local conditions, police community relations, socioeconomic conditions, you know, we have to move, if not, I mean, you know, forget the county, we would love to do city by city analysis or even neighborhoods. Or judge, um, judge by judge. I, I, I want to get judge by judge or, yeah. process, or DA by DA. I mean, this data is available. It's part of been our ongoing conversation. Every one of these meetings has devolved down to, we need to get more data or not devolved, maybe evolved to, we need yeah. the data. So yes, uh, I do want to move on to Senator Burton. I think you've been waiting for a question. Yeah, th uh, thank you and thank uh, the, the panel, very informative. One, I start with the bias that realignment had nothing to do with anything except the state trying to save money and put it on the counties. And I'm fairly certain of that. Uh, one question I'd like to ask or comment to make, I was always told that the greatest amount of recidivism was surprisingly forgery. Uh, which again, I guess is a, a property crime, or whatever that's worth. Uh, in our, in get, getting back to the judges, they're the ones when it's all over to decide, they may be buddies to the DA, maybe not. In our city, 100 years ago, when I was doing criminal law, we had a very hard line trial judge who was very enlightened about uh, drug things. And when I started practicing law, your second offense for possession of one marijuana cigarette would be two to 20, two to 20. And I had a case before this very hard line judge. He looked at the DA throughout the prior, the DA started argument. He said, the prior's out and you're out of the court if you just don't sit out. Uh, if you had another type of crime, uh, maybe a violent crime against a, an elderly person, uh, he would he would be tough. Now, one of the problems that I've seen in our city, we now have a very progressive DA. The prior DA was pretty good too, but not as intelligent, uh, I think, or as progressive as ours. But two of my best friends are like deputy police chiefs, and all they hear from the people uh, is not so much even auto theft, but it's breaking into cars and uh, getting uh, getting whatever the hell they can get out of it. You know, taking stereos, I mean, kind of stupid. Gonna be a crime, go rob a bank. But basically, I says, well, why don't you send it to the DA? Says, well, they don't, the DAs aren't, and that includes the old one, they aren't prosecuting theirs. They're concentrating on something else. And I would be interested, just for my own edification, whether the stuff I heard about forgery was right, but also, what are you gonna do when people in San Francisco, they're talking more about people breaking into their cars than they are somebody getting shot, unless, of course, the person was shot uh, by law enforcement. And it just seems, is we look at uh, the Cooper Initiative and one of the driving forces for the money is the retailers. And I was there when we did change petty theft with a prior, uh, I think, you know, got it into a wobbler, then it, it got taken out. So they use these reasons uh, to put money in, to put more people in jail and I don't know what the purpose of uh, public safety is uh, in the discussions to me should try to focus about one, reducing 
crime at the start, which is not crime, but conviction. What we're doing also reducing crime uh, by addressing the social root causes of crime, including racism, not that, you know, you're not white like me and all of a sudden you're gonna commit a crime, but you may be more driven to it just to feed your family. But uh, also it's just, it's not a good thing. We're talking about reducing prison population should not be the end goal of anything. It should be stop what, what one of our charges is, stop people got to getting into the system, but also uh, trying to get, which I think we're trying to get is again, some kind of uni uniformity. And I'm kind of babbling on, but I tend to do that at my age. Uh, but it just seems to me the information here is great. But when we go out and say proposition, this is going to reduce prison population, that's red meat for the campaign consultants that they want to let these people out of prison and into your neighborhood. So I, I don't know how we deal with that. And I don't know how we deal uh, with, uh, with the Cooper Initiative, but it's, you know, it's basically playing on the peers of fears of people. And like I say, they use the examples of, uh, I guess, breaking into my car is a victimless crime, except to me, if I got a really good car and a really good stereo and they're taking it away. But uh, again, you know, we don't want to be encouraging DAs. They say, we don't want to prosecute anything but violence. So then all of a sudden, they, they beef to the police, the police then come back and beef to the DA, then they beef to the, to the press. The next thing, the neighborhoods are having meetings, wanting, you know, tougher things. And it's, I don't know what it means. The only thing that I'm clear about is alignment was about saving the state money, grabbing the redevelopment money. It wasn't about reducing crime. I think it gave the state an opportunity to reduce prison population does not necessarily reduce crime. That doesn't need an answer, I guess. <laughs> well, I, I, do, I do have some, some thoughts. I mean, I, I you know, I, I think in terms of my own approach to criminal justice research, I like to think that what's guiding me is, you know, the objective of how do we minimize the harms from crime, not only the crime itself, but our responses to it. And so clearly if, you know, we have rashes of people <coughs> breaking into cars, which I know that that's a huge problem in San Francisco, um, you know, or, or other property crimes where there's not a, you know, a, a contact with a victim per se, it's still a problem and it requires that we do something about it. But I, I think what, what, what we have to think about as a society is what is, you know, how do we, how do we address those crime problems in a way that is is the least costly and the least harmful? And you know, for for example, now I, I know in the Bay Area and and around people are having their catalytic converters sawed out of the bottom of their car. That's a big crime problem in California, right? And it's happening over and over and over to people with specific. And then breaking into cars has been an issue in Cal, you know, in in the city since um, you know since 2013, 2014. Um, my understanding of those problems is, is that a lot of it seems to be kind of organized and predictable, and it really is a law enforcement uh, issue, and it's, and it's a problem, and, you know, we have to think creatively about a solution, but, you know, we can also ask the question, is the solution to this to, you know, sort of tag on a huge punishment for the crime or to, to put people away for 20 years, and what would we net, and would we be catching people who are necessarily very productive or just people who are hapless and get caught and, and, and what have you, right? That, that we just have to be deliberate and smart and strategic and focused um, in, addressing, in addressing crime challenges. Yeah, I'll just add one quick thing to that, very, very quick, which is that, yeah, a lot of these studies leave out kind of the, the guts of what's going on, right? We've got a policy change and then we have an outcome, whether it's crime or recidivism, but then we have all these actors, whether they're police officers, judges, you know, you name it going on and we don't really know what's happening. I've heard, I've spoken with a lot of police officers 
um, in sharing my research with them. And they said, you know, Prop 47, we're not even bothering responding to uh, low level offenses that people are calling thefts and that sort of thing. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I don't, that's behavior of the police impacting sorts of things. Um, I don't think it's going to affect the findings because what we find for auto theft, for example, auto theft is one of the most well reported crimes because of insurance purposes. So we actually have pretty good data on auto theft. But for other kinds of thefts, I mean, the police, ha if, if, there's, if there's concerns and people are, are reporting and the police are not responding, I'm not quite sure that's a problem with Prop 47 as much as it is with police community relations or how we want our local officials to respond to the concerns of citizens. And I think that's a different question, a harder question to answer in many ways. Yeah, just, just a comment. Yes, of course. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I agree with uh, the comments in large part that John, uh, John made, and I made a note here about if there was any way of sort of uh, accounting for what I would term uh, victim trauma. And it would seem in terms of the uh, auto theft and larceny and other low level property type crimes. I mean, the absolute numbers uh, probably are, are, are significantly greater by several magnitudes in terms of the more violent and serious uh, felonies. And that means that there are more uh, victims and more victims uh, traumatized uh, by that. So uh, I think in proposing uh, reforms, and this, may, this is a political uh, question, uh, looking more at the practicality of it as opposed to the theoretical approach that legislators would have to consider when addressing the multitude of property crimes, the sentiments of, of the voters and how easy that would be to, to get appropriate legislation addressing that. And it may be, as, as uh, Professor Stephen said, uh, that uh, you know, it may be necessary to have task force and something to, to really focus on those crimes du jour, particularly in, in, in the big city. So uh, I think we, as a, as a committee should be mindful about the practicality aspects of how you deal with these minor offenses that are much larger uh, in number. And let me just say, as, as a former judge, it's true. I mean, the, the legal culture across the state, you know, varies from, from county to county. You know, on the Supreme Court, where I served for 10 years handling death penalty cases, if you're in San Mateo or in the Inland Empire, uh, you commit a felony murder, you're more likely to get the death penalty as opposed to Los Angeles and San Francisco where there is no death penalty. And the, the DA uh, candidate down here, who's formerly the DA in San Francisco, is also doesn't believe in the death penalty. So uh, we're a very diverse state in how we approach uh, uh, crime, uh, particularly serious crime. So uh, I don't know how you account for that in terms of... Uh, analyzing statewide data and coming up with a statewide uh, proposal to reform uh, the penal code. So, so those Just are a, I'd like to go on the record as saying, if anyone can provide county level data that would allow me to do the analysis, I would do it in a second. Yeah. It's, it's a matter of challenges. Yeah. We'll take you up on that. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. We have about five minutes left of this panel. I like to try to keep us on time. Um, I'd like to take my prerogative again to close things out. I'm going to ask for kind of a, um, rapid fire answers from our, our guests. Uh, first of all, to address um, one issue that uh, Senator Burton raised about recidivism and forgery. I don't know about forgery in particular, but the data from CDCR shows that the vast majority of recidivism, 80 to 90 percent, are misdemeanors and nonviolent crimes. So. There is, you know, a significant recidivism problem, but there is a very small percentage of which recidivism is for a violent crime, at least according to CDCR data, and we can uh, distribute uh, that. So the two things that I wanted to give in sort of the lightning round fashion were, of course, we'd be remiss uh, if we didn't just talk a little bit about race and how race may have been impacted by any of these reforms, or is just race part of the criminal justice problem in general? Um, or has there been different impacts on race with regard to the reforms that we've discussed today? And the other I wanted to return to is if you could reflect for just a few seconds, and again, we only have a couple minutes, um, about uh, the idea that um, Professor Raphael touched on as some sort of back-end 
um, way to address some of these issues, especially regarding age and rehabilitation in prison, whether it's second look sentencing, some sort of indeterminate type of scheme, increasing parole review, and uh, your general impressions about that. So uh, race and indeterminate sentences. And Professor Cooper, and I'm gonna start again with you if that's all right. So on the, on the race issue, unfortunately, my research does not address that question. My sense is there's been a handful of studies looking at disparities in arrest rates um, following these policies. My sense is that they've lessened the disparities but have not entirely addressed them. And I mean, that makes sense. They weren't designed to do that. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know, I can't say a lot about these studies. They're a little bit outside my area, but my sense is there's been a lessening, but it's not completely gone. And I'm going to plead the fifth on reforms because that's not my expertise, um, but I'm happy to evaluate them once they've been implemented. Okay. Uh, Caitlin? Um, I would defer to the researchers if they have any, or I guess Professor Raphael, if he has anything to add on the race question, um, I, or to Drew if he has anything to add. Um, on the second question, I, um, as I mentioned in my opening comments, there is a, there was legislation passed recently that has expanded the authority for judges to resentence inmates um, to lesser terms um, and consider post-conviction factors like um, how somebody is behaving in prison, um, their participation. Right that. Unfortunately, only a hundred or so inmates have been nominated right. in years, so it's really quite small. So it really gives a, th a lot of discretion to the correctional administrators um, and district attorneys, but um, perhaps a different uh, administration or if there were different, um, you know, perhaps that, po that policy could um, be changed in some way to expand the number of referrals should that be a priority of the state. Um, and then there, there's also opportunities, like I mentioned earlier, um, to expand, for example, the elderly parole pro process, which is being considered or other um, ways for having people be considered for release earlier um, than they would otherwise or um, being con people who would not otherwise be considered for release prior to serving a determinate term. Um, and again, we don't have specific recommendations there. Th these are just options. Thank you. Uh, quickly, Assemblymember Kamlager and then Drew, I know you had your hand up earlier if you have anything to add and we'll close out with... Uh... I was just going to say that CDCR has claimed that they have submitted num numerous hundreds of referrals that are bounced back by judges as it relates to early release. We could talk about this. I'm quite familiar. I'm, I'm working directly with CDCR on this. They've nominated 120 people based on their uh, what they call exceptional conduct. Uh, only about half have been ruled on by the judges. So they have sent back other cases for other reasons, but for the meritorious conduct, meaning people who they believe have earned their chance, it's only been 120 total statewide over two years. So it's really been quite minuscule. Uh, Drew, do you have anything to add? Yeah, the only thing I was going to add is actually just today, this morning, uh, PPIC released a study on the effect of Prop 47 on racial disparities and arrest. Um, I haven't even have had time to fully digest the abstract, but that would be something worth looking into, and I'll be happy to make sure that we get that to the committee. What's the headline? Um, I, I believe that there were modest reductions in, uh, in the disparities between racial groups and arrest. I think because it reduced the number of drug-related arrests, I believe that the gaps narrowed. Um, but that's like my, my five-second reading of the abstract. All right, well, so. hold it. Thank, thank you for bringing that to our attention. And Professor Raphael, do you have any thoughts again about race? indeterminate sentencing um, or any closing remarks as we uh, sure. wrap up? Um, yeah, so I, I, one of the authors of that study, those <laughs> I'll, give you the, I'll give you the punch link. But um, you do see a narrowing in arrests and it's, it's not huge, but it, it, it is there. But for, for some crimes, like for felony drug arrests, it's actually quite large. It's sort of the, the the arrest rate for African Americans for felony drugs post Prop 47 is actually lower than it was for whites before Prop 47, but it's it's dropped for for all groups in the state. Um, and the the other thing in that study that that we did is we we 
estimated overall incarceration rates by group from the census from pre-realignment to the most recent data, which I think we did through 2017. And you do see narrowing in California in overall incarceration rates, both jail and prison combined, um, that you don't see in other in, in the rest of the country. So, so our reforms, while they haven't been geared towards that, they, they have uh, given the disparate impact of race uh, on, on, um, on minority and Latino populations have narrowed the disparity somewhat. I, I, I like the idea of looking at the back end, and, and I, I think many over the years have argued that it, you know, adding more indeterminacy and, and taking advantage of information that is revealed by, by people uh, you know, when, they're, when they're actually serving their sentences, um, I think is, is definitely a productive avenue uh, to look at. And, and you know, whatever institutionally has to happen to, to think about how to use that information to, to um, you know, be more judicious, I think that, that would be a good avenue to explore. Thank you very much. Before we close this out, do any of the committee members have any final questions? All right. Uh, with that said, thank you to our panelists. As I often say, no good deed goes unpunished. We will certainly be back in touch with you. We would love to, you know, continue to bat our recommendations to legislatures, I think I mentioned, aren't due till January. So we're going to continue to be in touch with you and help as we advance these ideas, as we continue to formulate our ideas, we'd really appreciate your ongoing help and support. Similarly, if you have come across um, studies or any ideas, uh, please, please don't be strangers. Uh, you know how to reach us. We'd really, really appreciate your input. We appreciate your time this morning. So thank you very much. Um, thanks for coming. So with, with that said, uh, we're now going to move to the public comment section of uh, today's meeting. Uh, we have, it looks like, a couple of dozen uh, members of the public. If they would like to raise their hand, uh, I will recognize uh, people for uh, two minutes if they have any comments or questions. Um, so I believe uh, Joanne. Joanne, we can't hear you. Okay, okay, oh, you can you hear me now? Okay, I, I just want to thank the panelists and the members um, for, for what you're doing. Um, I'm Joanne Shear with Felony Murder Elimination Project and I finally get to see Caitlin O'Neill's face. I've never met her, but she's been very helpful. Um, I, I just like to raise the issue of people who are serving life without parole um, in prison right now. Um, between 2000 and 2017, the share of prisoners aged 50 or older more than quintupled from 4% to 23%. Um, my question to you is, life, those who are serving life without parole, as we, as, as we most of us know, um, are serving under felony murder special circumstances, which means that many of them are not violent offenders. I, 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 I hate to use the word uh, violent, nonviolent, but many of them are not, but they're, they're going to die in prison. So my question to you is, uh, they, they, are not they are not eligible for elderly relief. They are not eligible for um, compassionate release. They are not eligible to be re uh, for a second look under 1170D. They, they're, they, this is a population that nobody's paying attention to that are uh, rehabilitating themselves because they have been over the course of all of these years not able to, um, to participate in programs. So my question to you is uh, because we have an aging population that is increasing um, exponentially um, and we haven't stopped using special circumstances, we're adding about uh, an average of 130 uh, people per year to our life without parole population. Um, what, uh, is there a chance that you will consider um, uh, um, putting the uh, felony murder special circumstances on your agenda to point a light and shed some light and help our people who are serving these death sentences? Sure, thank you. You kept your question to exactly two minutes. I really. <laughs> I really appreciate that. 
Um, so let me answer the question this way. First of all, um, our charge is to review the entire penal code. So everything is up for review. Let me explain a little bit about the way that we've decided to handle our process this year, at least as we begin our review of the penal code. We began uh, with our prior sessions on alternatives to incarceration. So not even talking about people who go to prison at all and how that those different processes, altern uh, collaborative courts, diversion programs like that type of work. Uh, we are now getting into the sentencing phase of our review. Uh, our next session will be concentrating on short sentences. So sentences that are impacted by realignment, sentences to jail and short prison sentences in uh, CDCR. We will then move on to the longer sentences that you're talking about, life without parole, uh, enhancements, three strikes, um, gang enhancements. Um, so that won't be till we later on uh, in the year and earlier in the fall, we're gonna take a deep dive into those questions. Uh, absolutely. Um, and then we'll get into reentry and parole. That's the general scope of the way that we've decided to handle this year's uh, review. So it's definitely on the table. What would be extraordinarily helpful to me at least, and I think to the rest of us, is again, the data, data, data. We know that there are people who um, are sentenced to life without parole under felony murder who are not the trigger people, as I think that you're uh, alluding to. Um, but, you know, there's wiggle rooms. There are a lot and there are many. We would really like to know how many. That would be extraordinarily helpful if your organization or you or any others have that kind of data. We're trying to suck up as much of that information as possible, not just from you, but also from public, uh, from state data to really get a handle on these problems. Um, and I will conclude by saying, as somebody who re represents people in prison and see themselves and see and witness uh, people who transform themselves when they have absolutely no chance of getting out. It is really a remarkable thing to behold. Um, and so I agree with, with just from a personal perspective. I mean, it, it's, it's extraordinary. So I have great sympathy towards, towards that. I don't know if any of the other panel, panelists uh, want to say anything. Um, all right. With that, uh, Sheila. Sheila, we can't quite hear you. You may be muted, Sheila. You are. There you go. Sheila, can you hear us? Maybe she could um, type out her question in the chat and you could read it out loud. That would be that would be terrific. Sheila, if you could type out your question in chat and either I will receive it or Tom will receive it and, uh, and otherwise we'll circle back to you. Uh, Joanne Shear. Um, I'm Michael, thank you. I just, I was the one that spoke first. So um, you've already answered my question. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, Christine. Christine Clifford. I guess she no longer has a question. No, I'm here. I just, it takes a while to unmute. Can oh, you hear me? Sure. <laughs> How are you? Good to see you. I'm, I'm great. Thank you for uh, uh, your ongoing work, all of you. Um, I, my question sort of big piggybacks on what Joanne had to say and um, around LWAP, but I'm, uh, you know, even, um, I'm wondering how addressing that the average age is 19, uh, that get LWAP, um, they're, the, most of them are first time offenders, et cetera, et cetera. There's a huge racial disparity in who receives LWAP. Um, if these things will be factored at all into your recommendations, that this is by research methodology, the most rehabilitative bunch of people at this age. They're mostly, um, if, it, if they didn't receive LWAP would fall under um, youthful um, offender parole hearings and they, they can't get that. They can't be involved in any programming. Um, I mean, this is an entire sector, violent or not, that um, are not allowed to take advantage of the very reforms that have been put in place to try and help that group, especially the youth offenders. And um, I'm hoping that it's gonna come up in your debate debates and is there any way to change sort of the whole CDCR um, 
thing when they get a regulation and they interpret it um, like 1170. Um, it applies to everybody but, and everything seems to apply to everybody but LWAP. Um, so I'm glad you're going to be addressing that later. That and, you know, the gang enhancements and everything else seem like there's a particular group of particularly youthful offenders that um, everything's sort of stacked against them. So that's, it's not so much a question as a comment and um, any feedback would be appreciated. Thanks. Sure, I'll take a couple of seconds. Um, so as I said, we're going to get to long extreme sentences later on in the year. Um, uh, LWAP uh, inmates are sometimes excluded from these reforms for purely political reasons because they are uh, generally considered the worst crimes. They are also excluded, and maybe Caitlin, who I see is still here, um, because some of these um, crimes cannot be, uh, or punishments cannot be affected without a vote of the legislature. And I don't know if that applies to LWAP cases or not. Caitlin, do you have a quick answer for that? Um, generally, I you mean can't the law can't be changed without a vote of the people? Right. Yeah, and I believe that that's generally the case for for a lot most right. a lot right. cases. So that's so that's part of the reason, at least, why uh, LWAP sentences have been excluded from some of these reforms. Of course, they're also um, generally considered, and I appreciate the felony murder wrinkle, uh, the most serious uh, crimes short of people who receive the death penalty. One of the things that I think is a very uh, difficult that has been alluded to in this conversation, especially when we talk about people who are older and uh, how age reduces crime, is that if you know if you if you were to rank sort um, seriousness of crime from murder to rape child molestation down the line to uh, drug possession and petty theft uh, the people who generally committed the most serious crimes sometimes have the least um, public safety recidivism rates that correlates with age but there are other reasons for that as well and um, you know, as I think public safety is our priority, is the penal code's priority, um, but there are other values at stake, in turn, in current, in, including uh, retributivism, that I do think should be calculated as part of prison sentences. Um, but um, that said, uh, when, they have, when they serve no purpose in terms of retributivism, when they serve no purpose in terms of uh, public safety, um, and in fact, we can improve public safety by reducing some of this incarceration, especially around people who have really proven themselves rehabilitated. Um, I think that those are all things that we should be, you know, really at the core of our focus as a committee. As I said, when we, on the very first day when we started this committee, my goal is to reduce, you know, advance policies that reduce recidivism, excuse me, reduce incarceration and improve public safety at the same time. Um, I think it can be done. I think that some of the research that Professor Kubrin referred to about um, not only just reducing recidivism, uh, reducing incarceration, but investing in alternatives to incarceration and services in the community seems to be working. Those are the type of programs that we would really like to um, explore further. And also the criminogenic effects of long-term incarceration, just by shortening sentences, you can both um, improve outcomes, public safety outcomes, and reduce incarceration. So those are things I think that we're looking at um, on top of the budget issues that um, the folks from LAO uh, referred to. I don't see uh, any additional questions from the public. Um, so uh, I think we're gonna wrap it up here, unless there are any members from the committee that would have like to have any last words. Okay. Um, so let me conclude by thanking everybody, especially our panelists who stuck around for the public comment period. Extra credit for you guys. Um, as I mentioned, we are um, going, we're trying to go through the, the penal code in some sort of logical progression. Um, our next committee hearing, which will be at the end of July, July 23rd and 24th, will be focusing on short sentences um, how we, we have not yet defined what exactly constitutes a short sentence, but certainly jet sentences to county jails and then short stays in uh, CDCR, both in terms of their costs to the system, the sheer number of people involved in the system, public safety implications of those short sentences, um, and how um, we be might be able to optimize uh, the use 
of uh, our public safety and um, prison and jail uh, resources. So that's, that's what's uh, on tap in our next episode. Um, I hope that you can all uh, join us. Um, and as to the committee members, I, I sent you guys an email yesterday, but it also goes to all members of the public. We really, really, really do want to try to facilitate this conversation as much as we can. It's sometimes difficult in these, you know, in these particular times. Please don't be strangers. Members of the public, you can be in touch. The best way to be in touch is with Thomas Nasowitz, who is our committee uh, staffer on this. Um, and we really do want to take as much input as possible. Thank you all again. Stay safe and stay sane. And I look forward to get, seeing you all again soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.